Hello and welcome to this first discussion in the Unsit Your Back series. The point of this discussion is really for me to give you all of the information I think you need to get started with the Unsit Your Back movement protocol as soon as possible. As we all uncover in this discussion that the movement protocol is one wing on this bird, one side of this coin, or one wheel on this bike. It really does have a partner in crime, and that's what this information is intended to give you, that other wheel, that other wing. And so, let's get into it. Trying to be comprehensive and concise at the same time is a very difficult thing to do. So, as long as this lecture might be, or this discussion, it is my best attempt to give, to be concise as well. And it does contain, according to my personal opinion, the bare minimum. You may consider it to be more than the bare minimum, but I really do believe we need to be on the same page with a few fundamental principles and philosophical ideas to, to take this protocol seriously and to understand it in such a way that we can install it for the long term. We can comprehend it and really reap the long term compounded benefit. And that, I believe, comes from a sense of understanding the knowledge, understanding the, the goals and understanding how to apply the tools properly. As I mentioned already, the movement protocol is part of what we could consider medicine. And we know that to get the benefits out of any medicine, we really need to stop drinking the poison that we're trying to fix in the first place. What I mean by that, or to explain what I mean by that, I think we need to go right back to a foundational truth and start from there so we can develop these ideas. The root principle that we will be looking at healing pain and injury through is cause and effect. We can, we are going, to, I'm going to assume that we agree upon this fundamental fact this irrefutable law of nature that pervades and persists through all phenomena in our experience in the observable universe. Fact. Truth. And what does it mean to say that something is, or that cause and effect is a principle governing the activity in our universe? Well, means that every single situation, every single state, every, every condition or possible condition exists as the result of conditions or causes that came before it. Conditions cause new conditions. There is a causal chain linking one moment to the next. And we can't arrive in any situation or experience without passing through the necessary and appropriate conditions that cause that situation or experience. In essence, every single thing that we experience has its roots in causes that came before. Said differently, any situation or condition that we are in is the net result, the cumulative sum of all of the activity that has led up to this point. And as it pertains to us, as it relates to our condition, it is all of the activity related to us that has brought us to this point. And all of our activity comprises of all of our actions and all of our reactions, physical, mental, and emotional. Every, every, every activity, every action 
every reaction has combined, compounded, and been linked together to bring us to this moment. Even the common debate of whether we are shaped by nature or nurture. Is it the conditions we experience in this life that determines what we become? Or is it our genetic predisposition that sets the blueprint for what what we are to become? To acknowledge cause and effect means that even those two opposing ideas, which we assume it must be one or the other that determines us, Even those two ideas, nature and nurture, all of their power to shape what we become lies in their ability to shape our behavior. Any power they have over shaping what we become depends on their ability to shape our behavior first. Then it's our changed behavior which changes us. Cause and effect also means there are no shortcuts. There is no way to bring about any instantaneous change in any situation, in any condition or state. You cannot change it from one thing into another without passing through the necessary steps to get from one place to the other. But now most importantly, where this also brings us is to a place of recognizing that we are where we are as a result of our activity and that to change our condition or state in any way depends entirely on us changing our activity. Our action, acknowledging cause and effect, demands that we take full responsibility for where we are at and where we want to go. There is no way for us to get anywhere without doing what is required to get there. And no one can do it for us. There are no shortcuts. And this is the law of nature. An irrefutable fact. Within this acknowledgement of our responsibility, there is a beautiful paradox. Almost by passing through the portal of Accepting blame, taking the blame, realizing that we have caused our own suffering, that we have caused our own injury, our own disease. It's by taking that responsibility that then we step into a position of claiming the power that is needed to change that, to cause a new condition. So by taking great responsibility, we access the necessary power to change things. Such a beautiful paradox. Only by acknowledging that we are responsible for our problems can we access the capacity to fully overcome. I mean, by definition, if we think even 1% of the causes of our condition lie outside of our own activity, then 1% of the power to change our state is now outside of our control. It is exactly what it means. And in order for me to believe that I have full power to create new conditions, I have to first acknowledge that I am fully responsible, I am the cause, and it is my activity which determines my condition. Radical ownership, as Jocko Willink would say. Extreme ownership, I believe, actually. Radical responsibility is another term. Accountability. We are setting this foundation because it is this framework, this mindset, that we need to carry with us, especially. It's, there is no condition or injury that I have seen that is so, I mean, it's a strange thing to say. I've I've come to see all conditions and injuries benefit from this way of thinking, from this practical philosophy approach. 
But lo- what I mean to say is that lower back pain is a beautiful example, as you will experience on this journey, of how necessary it is to acknowledge that our own actions are causing the problem because we will continuously need to investigate what we are doing that is improving or harming the state of our lower back. Cause and effect takes us to a few more places I would like to cover before we move into some some content more specific to the lower back. But what happens consequently when we when we acknowledge our activities at the cause of the problem? Then when we have a problem, that problem is a signal rich with information that we can use to reflect on our behavior. Pain and injury are not merely inconveniences then to forget as soon as possible, but they become cues that we can use to evaluate what we have done to get here and what we are doing or not doing that is driving us to stay here or causing this condition to persist. Pain and injury become profound teachers on the journey to optimize our physical activity. Not arbitrary, unlucky, unfortunate or misfortunes that we try and put behind us as quickly as possible and forget about. And within that, there's a strange psychology of, or we'll get to that in a moment, of a, of a, of a blind and stupid body that has a tendency to break and do silly things. So all in all, wrapping up this philosophical foundation, which is important to establish because we can now agree that pain and injury are entirely our responsibility. Our actions are both the cause and the cure for everything good and bad that we experience. And even if this doesn't sit as truth with you now, comprehend that that is what this protocol is based upon. And I urge you to fake it. If you want to experience something different, then Fake it till you make it and use it as a guide tool. You may not believe that right now, but have patience and stick it through. If it really doesn't sit with you, then this protocol is not for you because the entire paradigm is built on us taking absolute responsibility. And we need to agree on this single fact for yours and my relationship to flourish as I guide you through this protocol. We are the cause, we are the cure of both health and disease, injury, pain and vitality and energy. As long as there is any symptom of straying from the system that we can think of as our body-mind, we will strive to look for which of our actions are causing it to persist? We are going to agree that pain and injury are not misfortunes, that we simply try and overcome or move past. They are signals rich with information that we can benefit from, that we can use. And not just in an indirect or arbitrary way, we can use them to optimize our own action. The very thing we have just discussed is the prime determinant of our experience, of our states, of our conditions. What could be more valuable than information that can help us optimize our activity? The benefits of which we've covered a few implications, the benefits are many, but What I appreciate the most of really installing this program into my thinking and my perception of health, I feel powerful because I know that everything that causes us suffering is actually in our control. That is what I believe now and I have experienced. 
So I know it really shifts, has shifted my perspective away from a victimhood stance or perspective and has turned me into an opportunistic optimist. And I'm constantly looking for how I can use these experiences to improve how I can use something as negative seeming as an injury as a as a tool for my growth as a as a gift St- professor stuart mcgill on which we have to whom which we have a lot to thank for this protocol actually has a book written title the gift of injury and if you are watching this course and if you are interested in this topic go check it out so thanks for coming with me on that journey as we laid out our philosophical foundation really important and let's bring it home a little bit closer to the topic of low back pain let's bring it to health and to healing what are the implications of cause and effect? Well, how does it play out in the process of healing? Now, if we look at healing very closely on a molecular or cellular level, we see that it is largely the consequence of a shift in the balance between two opposing forces, one being a collection of forces which drive healing, and the other opposing force is a collection of forces driving breakdown. And our body, which is absolutely not a static object or phenomenon in any way, is continuously changing. Tissues are continuously cycling through life cycles, they are being replaced, they are being broken down, they are experiencing stresses from the environment, they are experiencing healing from within, and this is completely natural. And our body is continuously managing many balances, which we could call homeostatic balances, or a state of homeostasis, which is a sort of equilibrium. And... When it comes to our musculoskeletal system, we are here talking about lower back pain and movement, physical activity, but it's not disconnected from other aspects of our life, from our like our psychology and our nutrition. But in general, breakdown has a role because, for example, when we go to gym, what happens on a microscopic level, we are deliberately causing a kind of stress onto the tissues, onto the structures, causing a breakdown, which then elicits or promotes a a response of healing, healing which actually increases resilience, increases strength, and prepares us better for those loads in the future, those activities. Now, so there's a shift into breakdown and then repair. But it's when there is an imbalance in this or there's too much of one and not enough of the other or vice versa, too much breakdown or insufficient recovery or impaired recovery can lead us into states of chronic healing or breakdown, chronic breakdown, a persistent states of breakdown, which cause chronic pain, eventually leading to tissue breakdown injury and so on and so in order for us to recover from an injury we need to be able to shift that homeostatic balance back across the spectrum from breakdown towards the repair and healing side and we probably so what what do we how do we achieve that we increase the forces that produce healing and we decrease the forces that are producing breakdown and in this way we can ship the balance in a set of tissues towards healing and away from breakdown because that is inherently what the body's telling us that's what that pain signal is saying hey imbalance here too much breakdown 
starting to lead to a point where the tissues are actually not going to function properly. And I'm just letting you know, please use that information. So immediately that signal is asking us to look, wait, if I consider my activity in its entirety and I consider which actions in my general behavior might be influencing my lower back and which of them may be promoting healing and which may be causing breakdown. We immediately need to start evaluating our lifestyle, our behavior, our activity. But inherent in that investigation, we have acknowledged that we are responsible for this information that's coming to us from our lower back. It's not some... I mean, this sounds very logical when we lay it out like this. It sounds very reasonable. But most of us think our lower back pain or any pain or injury is some it's like random it'll pass it's come from nowhere and it'll go back to nowhere it's just a a phase that we're going through and phases pass it's in my family my parents they have similar conditions yeah it was that one thing i did i had a sneeze i'm so like i'm so lucky the sneeze caused it for me that's not the approach that we, that we use, that we promote. We need to go deeper. We need to acknowledge that we are responsible. This information is telling me to take responsibility and to investigate. And by acknowledging that we are the cause, we can then perform this in analysis. We can then start to understand what behaviors to increase and what, or adopt, if we haven't started them, or what behaviors to reduce or stop entirely. And in this way, pain and injury become the teacher, as I mentioned, and uh, we can start to respect the body in a different way. In some of these false beliefs that I mentioned earlier, in order for us to believe that the body just spontaneously and randomly spits out pain, that it arbitrarily breaks down unintended that it's unavoidable for us because of our genetics or any any number of these these belief belief systems ideas they rest on a foundation of us essentially believing the body is blind and stupid and really really prone to doing random very inconvenient, uncomfortable things. And, I mean, that, that's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. And what I appreciate about what this, this philosophy or this approach to injury, what it's led me to is, by me understanding that my actions are causing this, and that through my actions I can change it, I start to have, I have started to have a profound appreciation for my body's ability to first of all be resilient to the ignorant activity that we insult it with. Somehow, despite us behaving in, com- in ways which are completely opposite to our healing, it somehow puts up with that for decades. And on the other side of the coin, once we take responsibility and align our actions towards healing or towards the outcomes we choose, the body's ability to heal itself from anywhere is mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-bending. What this system of systems is capable of, that we inhabit all day, every day, So that's a profound and important shift to make as a human, to go from this, I live in a blind and stupid and inconvenient body to, holy smokes, this thing can do anything. If only I take responsibility with great responsibility comes great power. And it's, it's quite curious how even these experiences like pain, which we've demonized and run away from, tried to deny, even those become our teachers. And so even these communications from the body, which we have assumed to be 
essentially side effect of side effect become intelligent signals that are genuinely rich with actionable information that improves us. I mean, come on, that is it's amazing. It's really, really amazing. And so in this way, pain and injury become teachers of ours and we start to evaluate all of our behaviors. But now, that you might be thinking is a tricky thing to do. How do I assess how everything or anything that I'm doing affects my lower back? And uh, yeah, well, we can, we can, we're going to look at it through the lens of eat, move, meditate. And just in short, why eat, move, meditate? Well, if we look at on a really high level, what forces change us over time? And the forces that change us are things which interact with our genes, with our genetics, and then cause us to express or repress certain genetic expressions. We upregulate and downregulate, balance, imbalance, and through our genes we express ourselves, but through the epigenetics, the forces which control the genes, which direct the genes, we our, our expression is determined, our genetic expression is determined. So how do we look at all of the forces which then influence our genetic expression? Of all the epigenetic possibilities, three come are clear leaders in, in a few ways. If we look at which are the most unavoidable epigenetic forces, every minute of every day, every day of our lives. So unavoidable, well, that needs to be addressed because we never cease being influenced by that. Which are the most influential forces, which have the most profound effects and far-reaching effects across our entire system? And which are the most controllable epigenetic forces? Because if we can't control it or do anything about it, it's irrelevant. And the three collections of behaviors or activities that all are completely unavoidable, are extremely influential, yet completely controllable, are our nourishment, which includes everything from sunlight to water and food and what we put on our skin, all the energy and matter that flows into it, into us, our nourishment. Then our physical activity, every single thing we do with our bodies every day that is composed of movement. And then lastly, our psychology, how we think, how we psychologically react to our experience and uh, what practices or we use or don't use to change our psychological states. So... That's a discussion for another time to further justify why these three domains are, are standout opportunities for us. That's a very, very brief summary. But we're going to incorporate that, and that is the template we're going to use to now analyze our behaviors as they relate to our lower back pain in terms of what harms or increases the breakdown in our lower back and what improves or increases the healing in our lower back. In terms of our nourishment, our physical activity, and our psychology, eat, move, meditate. Now, I almost called this discussion the two wings of one bird or the two, the bird's two wings or something like that. And it, what it is, is these two simultaneous and parallel pursuits that we need to engage. Many people think they can start taking some form of medicine and they don't need to change anything else and they will improve. Or they can go to the, see the therapist and they can go to the therapist five days a week and do more than enough therapeutic exercise. They won't change a thing about their lives or all of any of their other activities and they expect something to change. Well, I hope that now seems like a silly idea based on these foundations we have laid. 
we have to simultaneously look for which activities we need to improve, increase, or adopt. And at the same time, we have to look for which activities are actually causing the problem in the first place. And how can we reduce them or remove them entirely? That is this approach. And if you are not willing to take both of those seriously, then you may not get, you will probably not get the results you deserve. Complete recovery and extreme vitality. So we're going to keep it in that order. I like to think of it in terms of that flow of energy. And there really is an order, an hierarchy. Everything rests on our bed of, of our nourishment, our nutrition, and then what we do with that energy, and then the highest application of it and almost the purpose, the end result is our psychology. But let's start at the nutrition. And this is definitely not a course in nutrition. Nutrition itself is a, a beast of a subject to unravel and to seek any common ground on. But we cannot skip it because we will not achieve the results we seek without taking some serious steps in this way, in this domain. So I'm not going to provide too much context or explanation as to why I'm sharing what I'm sharing or what I'm saying. That's for another series altogether. But at this moment, you're going to have to trust what I'm saying or you're going to have to validate it for yourself. But what I would like us to achieve with this brief mention of our nutrition and what you would most benefit from doing is installing an idea into your consciousness. The idea that food is incomprehensibly rich with information. Information that our body is extremely sensitive to. Our bodies are extremely sensitive to. We may have desensitized ourselves consciously, but that doesn't change what is happening. Cause and effect, action, consequence. There is no free lunch. We consume all of that energy information, matter, and it ripples through our entire system, touching all tissues, all genes, our nervous system, our hormonal glands, and right throughout the, the fluids and the bloodstreams, etc. There is no free lunch. You cannot consume a single thing without facing the consequences that it will wreak throughout the body. This is so underrated. So please do not, however new this idea might feel or seem to you, do not underestimate the role that nutrition might be playing, is definitely playing, in your ability to recover effectively. And it also profoundly impacts or influences our sensitivity to pain in any moment. It's actually become a, a signal, another signal I use, some of my old, oldest injuries that feel perfectly fine on most days. When there's a subtle shift in the the way the stability of, of it, my joint called my right knee is like rich with information. A slight change in its sense of stability or a slight sensitivity on the side of the joint that w that's not there and I don't have a mechanical explanation for it or I've just developed the sensitivity to tell the difference. It immediately because I'm learning to speak that language, I can understand, oh, that is a cue for me to investigate why, how have I introduced an increased inflammation in my entire system through my nutrition? What have I eaten that has changed my experience of 
this area, this structure in my body, which is prone to, or to easily becoming inflamed. So it's become like a little ra- a little meter, a little sensor that can indicate to me. And what I'm trying to explain not very well here in a convoluted manner is how sensitive my body's pain signal is as, as a direct result of what I'm eating at that time or what I ate yesterday, you know what I mean, what I am eating in, in this general moment. So nutrition and once again in a very logical and reasonable sense is the actual energy information and structure that we ingest to then provide us with what we need to heal. It's not an indirect or optional part of the process. It is the fuel for the process and the signal rich with information. It is the fundamental way our body regulates its general state of healing. And the, if there is a medicine for, like for our physiology, something that we can consume from our external environment, it is our food. And once again, there's another deep rabbit hole. Once you start to turn over all the rocks, optimized nutrition can heal anything. You just have no idea how optimized your nutrition can be. So to wrap it up, food is no small deal. It is providing our body with the components to rebuild structures. It is rich with information. It ripples throughout the whole system. There is no free lunch. And it contains the energy we use to move, think, feel, and heal. So if we now look at nutrition just briefly before we move on through the lens of harmful actions and beneficial actions, what are some categories of harmful actions you should be analyzing if you think I'm not sure if my nutrition is optimized. What do I do now? Well, let's look if there are harmful actions present or in excess. Because harmful actions shift the balance towards breakdown. They are a new stress on the system. They, pro- they might lack. They may, they may be insufficient in the tools we need to heal. And simultaneously, they can be, become a stressor on the body instead of a gift, part of the healing process. And in this way, they move us away from a state of health, of optimal health. And primarily, this is moving us towards states of increased inflammation, toxicity, and as I just mentioned, states in which we lack the fundamental components to heal, etc., etc. So what foods are pro-inflammatory or pro-allergenic? Allergy causing like foods. I have a few. Six that I avoid. Gluten, dairy, sugar, alcohol, caffeine, and seed oils. Of course, everything else like processed foods, most foods with a label, unless it says organic on there three times and you read the ingredients and it's very simple. Labels, already, it's a very complicated product far removed from nature. So pro-allergenic foods are, like I mentioned, gluten, dairy, sugar, alcohol, caffeine, seed oils, anything that's processed. Toxic food substances can often include factory farmed animal and plant products that come off massive factory farms and are usually riddled with everything from herbicides, pesticides, growth hormones, antibiotics, yeah, and then post-production from spraying apples to be pinker to anything you can imagine. So large-scale factory farm stuff, tricky as well. Locally grown, organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised, This is what you want to be looking for when getting animal and plant products. And then it is not excessive at all. The skin has been called the second tongue, our second tongue. What we put on our body, on our hair, nails, it all matters. So 
if you feel like you've optimized your nutrition, <clears throat> your movement's optimized, and you're still experiencing, you still believe there's room to improve, then, and you're using very poisonous products, very toxic products, by the standards I'm setting here, not by what the commercial claims is suitable for human consumption or application. No, then you need to start turning over those stones and having a look. And, why, and don't wait until it's a last resort or you reach a plateau. See what steps you can take straight away. Every little bit matters because there's so many scenarios we can't control. And so many moments where it is actually justified to you, you know, go to granny's house and she's cooked you lunch and it's, there's something in there you would definitely never eat on your own. And maybe that's the moment you want to cheat. So in all the other moments we can control, depending on your values and priorities, you want to control those moments. But before you know it, there are stresses and uh, challenges coming from all angles. And I think it's quite easy to find some new products. Then what are some of the beneficial actions we can adopt when it comes to our nutrition? Organic, whole food, nutrient dense, and a varied diet. You getting food from different food groups, getting foods with different colors, and typically foods that are more nutrient dense than low on nutrients. So, yeah, lots of water. And again, listening to the body signs and symptoms. Do I feel better? How do I feel after eating this meal? Do I feel lighter, heavier, stuffed to the brim? Have I got a lot of gas? How's my visit, visits to the toilet? All of these things, when you go down the nutrition path, of self-guided, intuitive nutrition, all of these signals are rich with inflammation. <laughs> rich with inflammation. Rich with information. The skin tone. Do you have any breakouts on your skin? Eczemas. All of these things are, are signs and symptoms that we need to use to investigate and analyze our behavior. Now, let's move on to movement. This is not extensive at all because the majority of the movement, the beneficial movement practice, is covered in the movement sessions that you will follow. I will cover that at the end. But what is important here is how do we reduce the harmful actions? If the movement protocol, the unsit your back movement protocol, is the beneficial actions we are adopting to create the conditions we choose, then how do we reduce or remove the actions which are increasing the breakdown in our lower back? So when it comes to lower back pain, Almost inherently in what we've said, there is an excess of breakdown in the tissues which make up the lower spine. Those are primarily the discs and the vertebrae in between the discs, as well as the ligaments that house those entire structures and keep or connect them, should I say. So which activities or which types of activities tend to place an undue amount of stress and breakdown on those structures. And those are what we need to hone in on. And unfortunately, our modern sedentary seated lifestyle is rich with activities which strain our lower back structures. So we need to, inherent in the kind of unwanted activity on our lower back are a few factors. We have a lack of awareness of what position our lower back is in at any given moment or what it's doing at all. We don't have a, the support or the skill to support our lower back in any position, in any activity and any position. And we have restrictions in our mobility throughout the body which increase the strain on our lower back. So all of these issues that I've just described are caused by sitting. And what do I mean by sitting? Well, sitting at the desk at work. That's what a lot of people think of. I'm a, I'm a desk warrior, so I sit a lot. But we sit in our cars. We sit on the planes and the trains and the bicycles and buses. 
We sit at meals, we sit at meetings, we sit when we help our children do homework or they sit when they're at school, we sit on the toilet, we sit when we wait for the bus, we sit when we, like I said, when we're on the bus, we, we sit all the time. And when we sit, we're going to cover this elsewhere, but when we sit, that natural concave curve in the lower back, the lumbar lordosis, is almost always, for all of us, almost all the time, inverted into a convex kyphosis. So that curve in the lower back is inverted. And this is when done for prolonged periods of time, repeatedly, day after day, month after month, year after year, for a few hours at least every day, it starts to put a lot of strain on all of the structures, the bones, the discs, the ligaments that traverse that outermost part of the lower back curve. Because if you think of how much, if the curve is naturally concave and then we invert it, all of those structures which run on the outside are in a stretched position and are straining under load, much more load than they would experience in, in a neutral position. And then we do that day after day, year after year, decade after decade. And eventually it adds up. Eventually it, 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 it just, the breakdown overwhelms the repair. There's a second layer to that, and a very underrated layer, is that that concave or that inverted curve of the lower back actually starts to become the default movement pattern for the lower back for a number of reasons. Then we start to approach many activities that we do. Every time we bend over to pick something up, every time we try and squat, every time we standing up from sitting, off, from sitting on a chair, all of these different movements where we should be hip movements or should be arm movements, we try to reach overhead, everything starts to now become a stress on the lower back because the, the lower back's not supported because all the muscles around it have become so weak and lazy and the spine we just even think about bending forward and where do we bend forward well in that same lumbar curvature because well it's just how we've programmed those neuromuscular structures so now every activity starts to become even in our walking and our running our lifting and our jumping starts to be affected i mean i've been a, it's a very superficial and a quick summary here of the causes of the breakdown from a mechanical perspective of the lower back but it's just enough to send you the message that you have to reduce the sitting the total amount of sitting that you are doing and you have to be aggressive you need to stand more as much as possible because there's a hell of a lot of sitting you're still not going to get away from all the sitting that you cannot get away from, we have to improve its quality. How do we restore that curving to the lower back when we have to sit and we can't get away from it? Then, yeah, and these are strategies like using a lumbar curvature, but being very mindful about what we're doing when we are sitting, which is very tough. But this is also part of what you need to figure out. If you start to pay attention to the shape of your lower back throughout the day, and I say keep it in a neutral position as much as you reasonably can, what do you have to do to achieve that? When you're sitting in the car, feel what shape does your lower back feel like? And you won't be able to tell with your mind initially. There's so little connection there. So use your hand. Put your hand on your lower back. We're going to cover this quite a bit in the movement protocol and feel the shape of your back in various positions. So in this way, we start to reduce the harmful movement activities. And for now, that's really it. Reduce the overall sitting, improve the quality of the sitting that we can't avoid. And of course, in activities where you are not certain, you can keep your lower back safe and in a neutral position because that's how we are reducing the stress on the lower back, whether it be golf or CrossFit or throwing ball with your kid, whatever it is right now, you will have to refrain. 
And the signal often for the lower back might only come as pain in the next morning. So if you wake up any day with pain in your lower back being worse than the, when you woke up the previous day, then you have to analyze what did I do the previous day that may have contributed to this lower back pain. There is a continuous investigation and it's not that easy to, to pinpoint often what is the exact cause of my pain today. And sometimes that's why we have to remove a number of activities which we are not certain of. If we cannot be certain that this activity is safe for my back, it's not putting my lumbar spine into that forward curve, it's not asking me to twist it or take it to end of ranges, then I have to remove it for now. And once I've gotten to a point where we've removed all the harmful activities and we're only doing beneficial activities, ideally, and we can start to wake up each morning, time and time again, our lower back wakes, we wake up with our lower back feeling better. Sometimes there are small fluctuations which are difficult to avoid from day to day, but week by week, there must be improvements. And of course, from day to day, I'm saying small fluctuations are normal, a little bit better, a little bit worse. But if something's significantly worse the next day, then it's worth looking at what did I do that previous day, for sure. And in this way, we're kind of using the signals again, but also starting to pay attention to what shape is my lower back. And I didn't make it that clear leading into this section, but <clears throat> the lowest stress position for the lower back is in its neutral position. And so, just like we would cast up any other joint that was injured, we could with a brace or a cast to protect it, to reduce the movement and just allow healing. And we remove all the stresses and allow the recovery. There is no way to brace our lower back into a neutral position other than with our own skill and our own muscles and our own discipline by avoiding the activities which would force us out of that position. And we'll get the quickest healing the more we are able to simultaneously honor the neutral position and avoid deviating from it. And so that's what this movement, this is what you need to carry forth from now. And no one can do it for you. I can, I can inspire you, I can motivate you, someone can give you instructions, but you are the one that needs with your hands on the steering wheel of your lower back all day, every day. And no one is going to be there to check what the shape of your lower back is when you reach into the bottom drawer to get a pot out for dinner. You are the only one who is there. You are the only one who can learn to continuously pay attention and learn and improve. And right now, the goal is a safe, neutral spine position which you are going to develop the skills and awareness in the movement protocol. That's what the movement protocol is designed to do, is to give you the ability to very confidently and very effectively stabilize the spine in a neutral position through a variety of different activities and movement. What are some of the beneficial movements? Well, as I've covered, it's kind of reducing the harm Avoid, reduce the sitting, improve the sitting. Be very careful of lifting objects up, especially initially you don't have the skill probably. That's why you are where you are. The way you've been doing it, the way you naturally do it has brought you here. Whether that's shopping bags or kids from school, you need to refrain. Uh, this fell under the harmful movements that we're trying to reduce. And then the actual beneficial movements is the intentional movement practice. Intentional and intelligent movement practice that you are going to follow in the video curriculum. In that curriculum, you are going to develop a very acute awareness of the, of your lower back, your lower spine throughout different positions and activities. You're going to develop the skill to stabilize those structures in a neutral position and you are going to restore mobility to your arms and legs so that you can rather look to them for range of motion rather than 
trying to compensate for their tightness by using your spine unnecessarily, introducing more stress. And as extreme as this sounds, it is the only way that I have found, based on the research and books, case studies of Professor McGill, with a few of my own extra flavors, but he has shown without a doubt that healing the spine and the discs from almost any condition is possible to a full recovery. And that's not what the the medical literature would say, but it is possible under specific strict conditions. And these conditions are what I'm describing here. Conditions which act as a kind of brace or cast for the the lower spine and the pelvis, keeping them in neutral, allowing them to heal fully through a process which can take 12 to 18 months. I did say it's possible, and I did say profound healing is possible, but it's not quick and it's not easy. The downside is the alternatives are pain and surgery and unskillful movement. So as arduous and laborious as this journey seems it's really the only option from what i can tell and by honoring these principles by using our discipline by staying persistent and being patient we we create a cast or a brace for our spine and just like any other splint we can allow the healing to occur and the reason why this is take so long one of the reasons is that the spine is inherently a column. And so pressure is a force that pushes outwards. And healing is a process which which usually depends on the flow of fluids and nutrients to the site of healing. And so how do you get flow into a column which is inherently full of pressure pushing outwards? Hydraulic pressure in the discs which make it very difficult. I mean, there's hardly any fluid flow, never mind nutrient delivery. So it's why, this is a a fundamental reason why this process takes so much longer to heal than other, other joints. And of course, it being connective tissues, these are not muscles that we're trying to heal. These are connective tissues in the discs and the ligaments and of course the bones as well. But it is a slow process but full healing is possible. And just before anyone gets upset with me claiming that, it's not full healing in the sense that you will have your 16-year-old spinal discs again. It's that the discs will, excuse me, the discs will fully stabilize and scar over and reach a state of functional stability and you will feel and move wonderfully. But no, you won't. You may have lost a bit of range at that specific disc, but you've healed and you're safe and you're functional and you're pain free and you can continue your movement journey. So that's a full recovery. All right, onwards from movement to meditation or our state of psychology. Here I'll be the most brief. Also, profound, do you know in an instant that we slip from relaxation into stress? perhaps through some sort of fright, in that very instant, our entire physiological and hormonal profile changes from one that is in a state of calm, healing, recovering, resting and digesting, they might say. And in an instant, it, uh, it can flip into a state of fight or flight, in which all of the energy in the body is rerouted, the priorities are shifted, and different processes occur and from through the lens of breakdown and recovery it shouldn't take a a long stretch of the imagination to see how our general state of repair and recovery will be far from optimized or rather we can say will be impaired by us being in states of stress or tension or depression 
for excessive amounts of times, for unnatural amounts of times. Of course, if we're dealing with something in life, an acute event, to experience stress and depression are normal. Depression, I mean, is like you break up with someone and they die, or someone dies and you go through a period of mourning. But when these states start to, when we don't recover from these states, when our stress becomes chronic stress, which never ceases, or it's something that we experience from wake until sleep, these start to have profound implications for our ability to recover from injury. So what do we do? We need to reduce the stress. And that kind of, it, it's in conjunction with what are the beneficial actions? Well, we need to increase our relaxation. It really is that simple. And it's, for most of us, it's a difficult thing to achieve because we have almost become identified, addicted, attached to the whole notion of being busy, stimulated human. And we are not even familiar with the concept of relaxation. Like the word bored is something I think is, it's, it's a non-word. A bored person is actually a restless person. They're not bored. Someone who has lost the ability to relax. And that is something that we need to inherently cultivate, whether that's walks through nature, bathing, body tension releasing and trauma releasing practices, mindful movement, yoga type practices, even things like saunas and cold water immersion, they, they play a role here in nervous system regulation. And then of course the meditative practices, which is the most advanced challenging yet profound forms of relaxation in which we really, really minimize the body's and the mind's tension. But at whatever our level is, we need to consistently ask the question, am I getting enough downtime? Am I able to bring my nervous system all the way from a state of sympathetic activity down into a state of parasympathetic relaxation? Super important. Am I regularly getting into states of relaxation? Can I relax? And if not, if you can't wind down, then you need to up the game. You either need to increase the duration you're trying to relax, the form you're trying to relax, the, your approach to relaxation, take assistance. And like I said, there's so many ways to go about this, but you need to find ways to completely and stay there for a while. And moving on to the last section, which is kind of its own pillar, eat, move, meditate, is always supported on the bedrock of healthy sleep. If you'd like to know more about sleep at this stage, go check out Matthew Walker. He covers this extensively. But through the lens of this introductory course, I'm just going to keep it simple. How do you feel when you're waking up? Do you feel like you've had enough sleep? And, and do you feel great before you've had any coffee or anything of the sort? Even though I did recommend not having caffeine, it's definitely better for me. And one of the reasons I don't like caffeine is it disconnects me from my own body's energy and I can't tell if my energy is good or not. So then it becomes confusing in that sense. And then simply how much are you sleeping? Are you sleeping seven to nine hours? Do you feel like you've got enough? And are there any days of the week, two, three, four days of the week that you're able to wake up without an alarm and feel great, feel super rested? So sleep, always going to play a big role. One, two nights of bad sleep, you could feel your pain increase, your body's recovery is going to decrease. These all matter. And if you're not getting the results you want, then there's a lot of places to look. Now, I've covered everything that I advise people to address in this course to get recovery in the lower back if this sounds like you need to change your whole life and it's a lot well then i think it's good to be grateful this is here to ask you to change everything that's really the message and unfortunately if you don't listen you go down another path where you will be debilitated eventually and your entire life will be changed by force and in ways you don't control so rather take the radical revolutionary option now on your own terms 
As I mentioned at the beginning, this long discussion was my attempt to really bring you on board with my thinking and with the basic tools and information that you need to move forward from now as soon as possible. This is only not even an hour and a quarter at this stage, so I would like to think you could have listened to this in a day or two. What you will begin as soon as possible, preferably just after you've finished this, is the email course in which you will follow the weekly, the four weekly exercise sessions that are completely follow along. And you will sign up for that at craigvan.com forward slash unsit your back, all one word, unsit your back. And if you haven't already signed, if you got through, if you found this video by signing up for the course, then you've already done this. But if you haven't signed up for the course, then go do that now. It will recommend you watch this video first, but you've already done that or listen to this as an audio. And then it's a matter of following those four sessions per week. And everything about those sessions rests in the quality of those movements, the nuances of the exercises, the subtle differences between a harmful posture and a beneficial posture. So take them seriously, get, make sure you can see me on the video and you can listen to me clearly with earphones in your ears, preferably cutting out any other distractions in the environment and hearing me clearly without even trying. And then to take this to the next level, I would highly recommend also reading the book Unsit Your Back, installing this through another repetition and with a few different words. And that would be a wonderful companion along this journey as well. And then this discussion is the first of a series in which I will be covering all of the content related to Unsit Your Back. And I would advise you to listen to all of the available sessions in this series. This really is a change of life. And there is no way to get the full benefits of this program or this protocol and achieve the full healing that your back is capable of without coming at it holistically. And this is a lifelong journey and that's why it's necessary to really give this everything you've got and to make it a way, a part of the way you live every day. It's not something to be ticked off and forgotten about, as I've mentioned. There is never going to be a moment in your life where it is justified to disregard the position of your body, your body's movement, to disregard its state of healing or recovery, to disregard any symptoms that it gives you. So these ways of seriously acknowledging anything the body communicates to us or anything the body does or anything we choose to do with the body is a way of existing that we must carry with us till the last day. So whatever reason has brought you here, let it be a profound gift. It's not a burden. It really is a gift. And what can you gain from this if you approach this with curiosity and humility as we should approach our injuries and our pain, signs and symptoms with with curiosity and with humility. Let's take responsibility. Let's listen to our bodies. Let's honor our bodies. Let's have reverence for our bodies. With great responsibility comes great power. If you follow this protocol to the T, there's no reason why within a year or in about a year, you will have everything you need and you will be as confident as ever to follow more advanced movement protocols or practices. I will hopefully have freedom of movement set up for you to follow if you enjoy this process, but there are many other ways to pursue it as well. And there is nothing more enjoyable than having a fulfilling body and mind. An enriching and rewarding movement practice can't be replaced by anything. So you deserve that. We all deserve that. It is our birthright. It is natural. And we just need to be a bit more deliberate about being able to maintain that now because our lifestyles are not spontaneously designed to, to nurture our vitality. We have to deliberately choose to cultivate it. But now in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. 
And if you are listening to me now, you have heard everything I've said. You have the information. You have the choice. And you are more capable than you can even comprehend. So I wish you well. I hope to see lots more of you. And let's, let's help each other. Cheers.